So, so wait a second. Are you saying that artificial intelligence isn't real? I didn't say it wasn't real. I said it is not operational at the level where it is driving these things. Well, can you do me a favor? Can you tell me when actual intelligence is operational? <laughs> and that's back to where we were just making the joke and why Tricia was looking forward to your talk because it's about people. Ah, but, well, so Tricia, I, I think I'm going to have to have your help because I'm in IT and I'm not good at talking to people. You haven't heard that before? Really? Okay, well, I'm going to ask that question right off the bat. What's wrong with communication? in cybersecurity. In your chat, in the window, just tell us what's wrong. What have you seen from your perspective that people do wrong when they're communicating about cybersecurity? I love interactive sessions. This is great. Yeah, me too. Uh, so folks, put that in. I think you have to put it in as a question. Um, and I'm going to hop over to Discord. Oh, we can't use the chat? Uh, I don't know if the, they can use the chat. I know that they can put stuff as a question so we can see it there. Um, and on Discord, um, we've got Jovi says not interacting. Kenny says it's not about lifting others up. It's about lifting oneself up. Interesting. Um, I think somebody's Did making a Discord work? joke. <laughs> well, so th that's the question I've been asking for quite some time. Uh, for a little bit of background, I got hooked on computers when I was in sixth grade, went to a summer camp they had uh, at a university, and it turns out that whenever you go to a university, smart people don't know how to use locks. And so we were able to get into the computing, uh, one of the computer rooms, and be able to play around with some computers. And we found the password was written down on some old printouts that had been thrown away in a trash can, and we were able to get into the system and start playing games and things like that. Now, we were in sixth grade, so the idea of holding them ransom or anything like that was just completely oblivious to us. We just loved playing games, and, and we found out all sorts of games that we could play. I don't know what else we could have gotten access to. And fast forward, I got a degree in computer science. I went, I was a system administrator. I was a system administrator for the Army. Uh, I worked for SAS Institute as a senior software developer, and I did IT security audits for Fortune 100 companies and taught organizations like Brink Security and the Tennessee Valley Authority's um, power producing companies uh, about uh, cybersecurity IT controls. And one of the things I had learned over the years is that when we present this information, too often times we're doing the pump and dump approach. We're giving a bunch of information and expecting them to be able to absorb it, and more importantly, to change the way they act. And that last bit is really difficult, and the approach that we've been using has some very fundamental flaws that go all the way down to the, neuro, the, the brain level to neuroscience. And so we've talked to a number of neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists and behavioral scientists and neuropsychiatrists, uh, about 190 people total. And we've been working with organizations like the National Institute of Standards and Technology and uh, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, ways that we are currently presenting information and looking for ways that we might be able to better align it with the way the brain actually works. So, uh, I, apparently I need to share my screen. Yep, yep. so I just so promoted I just you to a panelist, panelist and a presenter, and presenter while we were doing that. I'd like to thank the Academy for that. That was very nice of you. It's, it's really about the little people. So, the question is, does this really matter? Does this whole presentation, is it just pointless? Um, Elisa did a, a fantastic job of queuing me up, but I wanna take it one step further. She did really, truly a, a lot of great information that she had talked about. And uh, I, I wish that you know I could have the graphics that Nicole had and the singing ability that Bryson and Trisha had. I have none of those things. The only thing I have is hard questions and some disturbing answers. So first off, does this stuff really matter? 
And I want to give you an example of something that was created by the National Initiative, for, um, the National um, Institute of Standards and Technology, the National Center for Cybersecurity Education. They created this organism, this document called Telework Security, an overview and tip guide. Now, I don't really, I mean, it was great that they consolidated this information, but uh, and it's a lot of really good information. The problem is for me, I don't know that this is going to be easily absorbed by somebody else. And I don't think it's going to be retained by them. And lastly, I don't think it's going to change anybody's behavior. What do you see that's prominent in this, uh, this, this guide, this, this one sheet? You see a globe, you see a couple of icons, and you see some numbers. Now, does that improve your understanding of telework security? by looking at those things? If you had two seconds to look at this, what would you walk away with? My guess is probably not a whole lot. Would you be enticed to read more? I suspect probably not. You might, but I think that there's a lot of other people in industry that probably wouldn't want to look any further. So the next question I have for you is, are you, a law-abiding citizen. Now, this is a real important question because we, 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 we have some people that maybe they wouldn't answer yes to, uh, especially if you're on the hacking side. But most of the people that we're going to be working with day in and day out would like to think that they are law-abiding citizens. And because they are law-abiding citizens, they almost always like to do the right thing. Almost. Some of you have seen signs like this. I'm not going to say everybody, but I'm pretty sure pretty much 99.99% .99 of the population of this webcast is going to see signs like this populated all over the place. The question is, how often do you actually follow the speed limit? What do you do instead? Well, chances are you speed. What do you do when you find somebody that follows the speed limit? Chances are you get pretty aggravated. Why? Because this is a limit that's standing in your way. It is some a, a, a break on your ability to get from point A to point B as fast as you want to. It is an arbitrary limit in you know, many people's minds that is opposed upon you. And a lot of people resent it and even more people ignore it. So why do we think that when we create these rules about cybersecurity and tell people this is what you're supposed to do and this is what you're not supposed to do, why do we think that they're going to follow along? Well, you know, for, for them, cybersecurity isn't a life and death situation. But, you know, for people that are driving around and, and uh, on the highways, it can be a, a very life-threatening situation if they go too fast around a corner. But why don't they do it? Well, because it impedes progress for them. And I, I suspect some of you have been in, in situations where you are stuck in traffic. And, and how do you feel when you can't get to where you want to go in a timely fashion? Even if you don't have to be there on time, it's still incredibly aggravating. It makes our blood pressure go up. We get our stress levels go up. Even if we don't have a, a deadline, it's still an impediment that we don't like. Too often times, cybersecurity is viewed a very, the, the very same way. So what's wrong with our approach to cybersecurity education? Well, I, I think that, you know, as I said, Alyssa did a great job of explaining some of the things that you're supposed to do. I want to drill down even deeper. Why? Why do we need to do those things? And a lot of, for a lot of us, it's just because the world of communication has changed. We're no longer, you know, having to pick up the phone or write letters and put it in the post office. We're using social media and we're using messaging and things like that. And, and I don't know if you've had any kids, uh, you can't use those same methods that we did when we were growing up to communicate to our own kids. 
and you just ignore us. So that's a, a problem for a lot of us. And, and a lot of us have the problem of uh, the way we value communication. What we do has also been impacted. And we are not, we don't value the same things as we used to value. And we also have a lot more complexity, more complexity than we've ever had before as a species when we were dealing with especially things like the internet. This is a network diagram of the internet, the entire internet back in 1975. I had talked to um, a number of conversations and actually interviews with Vince Cerf, who's one of the inventors of, uh, of the internet, um, known for TCP IP. And we, they didn't perceive at the time that the internet would be as big as it was. It wasn't designed for the world that we have right now. It wasn't, security wasn't the big issue for them. And so we're trying to, we've unleashed this, this wonderful tool, this spectacular tool, and we gave it to the world, but we didn't give them any training on how to use it. We just let them loose. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Cerf had talked about was this notion, and he said that this wasn't exactly what he meant, but, but we need kind of an internet driver's license to tell people what they need to do and what they don't need to do and things like that. Just a little bit of training around how do we have basic cybersecurity hygiene or basic cyber hygiene in general. And that's not always easy to get people to do it. But the problem is the consequences of not doing it are dire because we depend on computers for almost everything. In fact, we could argue that there is not a single industry in the world that doesn't use the internet for something. And as, as such, it's a vulnerability. A lot of people didn't realize the consequence for all this connectedness was the security of our information, our assets, and ourselves. No one ever told them that. Right. Now, a lot of our approaches, unfortunately, of telling people the security is, again, as we mentioned, the pump and dump. We're going to throw a bunch of information at you and hopefully some of it sticks. It's the same thing as essentially as as pleasant as verbal vomit. Right. We want people to listen to us when we talk. We want to be as efficient as possible but we're optimizing it for us as the presenter and not often the audience and what they're going to do with the information and how they're going to retain that information. Most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. And with good reason, because in, when we're coming through school, oftentimes the education system, we're exposed to the lecture format. And the problem is again, the lecture format is optimized for the presenter not the audience. George Bernard Shaw said the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And for many of us in the cybersecurity world and many of us in communication in general, this is so true. We think that we've trained people. We think we've done our due diligence. But if we don't get them to actually change their behavior, all we've done is wasted a whole lot of time and money. Now, that may be kind of provocative, and I'm gonna make my case, and you get to decide whether or not I'm right or wrong. But I will tell you this, I've given this same talk, or a very similar version of this talk, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology to the Federal Information Security um, Systems Educators Association. So basically all the cybersecurity experts and CISOs and uh, whatnot throughout the federal government. And the gentleman that's sitting there uh, is the chief information security officer for the U.S. Department of Education. So this has been somewhat vetted, I would, I would hazard to guess. And uh, also, Vince Cerf, who also viewed this presentation, and you can see it yourself on YouTube, uh, said this was uh, entertaining, but also profoundly, disturbingly correct. Disturbingly correct. Well, that's disturbing. 
Why are we in this situation? Well, it's because we have brains. Now, for some people, this might actually be uh, questionable, the people that you end up dealing with, but I assure you, 99.99% of the people you deal with on an everyday basis have brains. The problem is a whole lot of us don't know how they actually work. And we make a lot of assumptions, a whole lot of assumptions about how our brain works. And it turns out that our brains are actually not wired, not wired for accuracy. They're wired for efficiency. The brain takes up 20 to 25 percent of our calories. So essentially, most of the time we eat, we're really feeding one org organ, and that's the brain. And so it doesn't want to use all that those resources. So it come up, comes up with all kinds of shortcuts. We talk about our gut instinct. Well, that saves us processing time, right? We can evaluate a situation and make a decision very, very quickly without having to go through every single step of the analysis to come up with a logical decision, right? And that comes up with some problems because oftentimes we make it an incorrect decision. But we're part of this is because our brain was designed for a world that we evolved into, right? A hundred you know a hundred thousand years ago, the world that we lived in was very different than the world that we live in today. And our brain was actually evolving a hundred thousand years ago and over hundreds of thousands of years, this is the structure that we get today. And the ones that were curious, the ones that had to have all the data to make an accurate decision, were eaten by the lion that was rustling in the bushes and said, you know what, that, that rustling in the bushes could be a lion, but it could also be a mouse. Let me go investigate and find out more. Well, they removed themselves from the gene pool and we got the one that said, you know what, I don't like that. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure as hell not going to find out. I'm hightailing it out of here. That's the ancestor we got. The one that was said, you know what? I don't need to have all the information. I'm going to make a decision and get the hell out of here just because it scares me. Nothing else. No other data. It scares me and I'm out of here. Well, I'm going to give you an example. Let's see if we can get you to experience this discrepancy, this problem ourselves. For most of us, our primary perception of the world is visual. Seeing is believing, right? But it turns out our vision isn't actually all that accurate. If you look on this graph, this shows you right here that most of the rods that see color, this is the structure of our, our eye that actually sees color. Most of it is just a little bit off the very center of our vision and it drops off very quickly as we go away from the center of our vision. And then in the, the, the cones, which see black and white, light intensity, drop off even faster. They drop off almost immediately the way we get away from the center of our vision. And you'll also know this point right here is called the blind spot. This is where we see absolutely nothing at all. Nothing at all. Well, what's the ramifications of this? Well, it turns out that what we see isn't actually what's actually there. Now, for, for all of you guys, see if you can see how many of you can actually see all the numbers on the left hand side, right? Can you read this is a 25? Can you read this number? 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 If you have perfect vision, perfect color acuity, you can see all the numbers. On the other hand, if you have uh, what they call a, a red-green color um, insensitivity, this is what you see. I'm more on the right-hand side. So I perceive the world differently than most of the people that are normal, have, have regular color. Uh, acuity that don't have any kind of color blindness. So the percep my perception of the world is fundamentally different than yours. 
and it's biological. It's not arbitrary. It's not me being willful. It's not me being um, ornery. It is a biological function. And we all have limitations, all of us. This is just personal, but we have bigger limitations that we don't really consider often. The image on the right is a, an example of what is presented to the brain, right? Or is, is presented to our frontal cortex, our decision-making uh, center of our brain. But that's not what the eye sees. Because of all those, the, 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 the concentration of the sensors in our eye that are concentrated in the very center of our eye, what we really see is more like the image on the right. It's very clear, it's clear in the center, and it's got color in the center, but as we get further away from the center, it fades to black and white and it gets fuzzier. Now that's what we, our eye actually sees. That's the information. Actually, it's not. That information is flipped upside down. That image actually should be flipped upside down and there should be a big black dot in the middle of it or off to the center just off the center where our, our blind spot is. So our vision is wickedly processed by our brain. And depending on how our brain and the things that we see in our life, our brain is going to interpret those images differently than if we saw other things. And this, this is, a, again, this is a biological function, right? And our perception of the world is heavily processed and it's processed by the things, the experiences that we've had. So when somebody paints a picture for you of what reality is, it's only their perception of reality. And it may not be anybody else's. You may be alone in that. So we have to both be cognizant of the fact that other people are gonna see the world differently than us, but also that when we try to communicate, that we work hard so that we can see their perception of the world. Because otherwise, we're gonna be talking to them and we're gonna be potentially arguing with them needlessly. Because what they see is different than what we see. So what do we do instead? Well, instead of trying to expect people to adapt to us in our communication styles, maybe what we need to do is start adapting to them. What do they need? And first off, actually looking at how our brain actually works. Now, this is a, mental, a model that we've been working with from neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists from all over the world, uh, trying to understand how our brain actually processes information and get to, uh, how can we improve our ability to get to action? And it turns out that understanding here is optional, that we can actually get to behavior change without them truly understanding what we're talking about. Now, you know, a child, we tell a child not to do all kinds of things. They don't necessarily know all the implications and all the rules and all the things that are there to protect them. All we tell them is don't, run out in traffic, right? And we punish them and we, we get them to, to change their behavior without them truly understanding all the ramifications. And there are a lot of other examples of that. Most of the time, our childhood, we're being taught a whole lot of rules and, and, and uh, moral values and things like that without truly understanding all the consequences. And we've been operating that way for, 100,000 years. So this actually works. Understanding, it turns out, while it's really valuable, is not required. In cybersecurity, behavior change is what we're after. We really need people to, to actually do the right thing. They may not understand it, but they have to be able to do the right thing. And so now what we do is we have to go back and reevaluate, well, how do we optimize our communication style for behavior change? Well, that's a long discussion. I don't unfortunately think we have time to get into that or to, to, to really cover that topic 
really well. Now, I will give you an idea that one of the things that you could do is reach out to a gentleman by the name of B.J. Fogg, Fogg uh, who used to run the Persuasive Laboratory, a persuasive, persuasive Technology Laboratory at Stanford. Uh, and he talks about how we can change people's behavior by using a different approach and a different timing. And so he, his model is that when we're trying to uh, try to motivate somebody to change, we have to bring the right prompt at, at, at the right time. And we need to make it, if it's, if it's something that's really um, important, we need to make it so that it's easier to do. So uh, this is a, a, an example where he says, that if, if under certain, certain, certain circumstances, giving people prompts will fail if it is uh, either hard to do um, and the motivation is low, that's where we're, we, we really need to work on either making it easier to do or increasing the motivation to do it. Because prompts alone, telling people to do it, won't work. And you can look at a lot of his work, and I've interviewed him, and some of the interviews are actually on YouTube. Um, you can go to uh, Google Sid Chopra on YouTube, and you should see some of these. So the question is, what do we do? Well, we have to make it stupid simple. Stupid simple. This is a gentleman by the name of Steve Cooper. Steve Cooper was the CIO of the US Department of Homeland Security. He was special assistant to the president right after 9-11, then became the first CIO, helped stand up the Department of Homeland Security. Then he became the CIO of the um, US Department of Commerce. And somewhere in there, he was the CIO of the, uh, of the FAA. Numerous number of, numbers of conversations with him. And, Whenever we talk about communication, he always says that we have to make sure that people, whenever they go out from our organization to business units or other organizations, that they take time to understand the, the audience that they're speaking to, their issues, their problems, their challenges, and show how we're supporting them in their mission. We cannot dictate, we cannot lecture them, we cannot browbeat them because we will not be able to get the behavior change we want. And again, you can see that inter interview with uh, Steve Cooper on YouTube as well. So what does brain friendly really look like? Well, this is an example of uh, a rework that we did uh, using some people that were PhD candidates in, in behavioral science and human factors to try to make that information more palatable to the way the brain processes information. So in the first few seconds, you can come away with something that would give you a grasp of what that document is explaining to you, making it compelling and at the same time informative. So that's that magic. How do we make something compelling? How do we make it informative and how do we make it motivational? So this was just an example, but we need to reevaluate all the information that we're presenting people to see, does it actually align with the way the brain actually works? Does it actually make somebody want to read it? Is, does it pique their interest? Does it grab their attention? Does it uh, give them a sense of trust that it's, that it's something that they're going to find worthwhile to read? Does it motivate them to act? And lastly, is it memorable? If we change their behavior today, what's gonna happen a week from now when we're not there anymore? Will they fall back in that same old behavior that got them in trouble to begin with? Or here, what happens then? We can't constantly be training them. We need to be able to do something profoundly different than just lecturing them. Well, how? Now, how is that going to look? Well, it's going to be tough. And I, I'm not going to 
lie to you. This is going to take some investment and we're going to have to spend a lot more time trying to rethink the way that we've been working for quite some time. And that change is, as, as much as change is difficult for them, it's going to be difficult for us because we've been indoctrinated in one approach and that approach we've been able to show, to show scientifically doesn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, that your community, our community, what can we do differently? What can we do differently to actually optimize our training and our education programs so that we can actually achieve a long-term change in behavior? How can we improve the cyber hygiene of the workforce? And if we're not, I mean, if we try to continue dumping this information to them, it's just going to confuse them. And then they're going to start turning off. And that's going to be a problem, perhaps maybe an issue for somebody else, but ultimately it will be an issue for you. I want to ask you one favor. Everybody pull out open your wallet and pull out a $20 bill, a $20 bill. And if you look at the back of a $20 bill, it says the words, in God we trust. As my late father would say, in God we trust, but everybody else has to pay cash. In our world, the only people we're gonna trust is God. We shouldn't be trusting anybody else. But when we're trying to get people to change their behavior, we need their trust. We need their trust. We have to, to work hard to win their trust. Because if we don't, if we don't work hard to gain their trust, well, it's like ripping their money, tearing it up, all their time, their money, and their investment. And that may be okay for you to waste their time. But somebody's paying the bill and they're not gonna be happy. And the question is, if, if we can actually connect with them in a way that's meaningful, if we can work with them instead of lecturing them, if we can get them to open up and to be a partner in the training, if we can inspire them instead of lecturing them. Why? Well, we can do magic. So I wanted to thank you for all that. Uh, I, I'm not as talented as some of the other speakers, but I hope that we've been able to spark your imagination, to get you to think differently, to invest your time and efforts in trying to do something magical and realize that the people that you're talking to, the way we're, the people that we're presenting to, the people that we're trying to change their behavior can actually be partners in creating this magic. And in fact, I would say they're the only ones that can create the magic. All we have to do is inspire them and, and get them to engage. You can follow me on, here's my um, social media, uh, options and you can as i mentioned some of these interviews and the presentation i gave at the national institute of standards and technology is available on youtube thank you so much for your time and i appreciate the opportunity to speak to you any questions many companies today use phishing exercises to encourage reporting and provide education to their user bases how do you address a repeat offender or someone who doesn't care about phishing exercises? How do you reach the people who don't care about how their behavior affects the company? Well, I think you're gonna to have to explain to them the consequences. I think that most people, once they understand that if the company is hacked, they lose their job, it, it oftentimes can, can change some things. There are also ways that you can use social pressure that their peer group can actually encourage them to do the right thing. 
people are very motivated by not wanting to stand out negatively in their peer group. It'd be one thing if they got, if they caused something that impacted them, but could you imagine what would happen if their whole company recognized that that's the person that let the, the company get hacked and that they're the reason why everybody lost their job? That's pretty mo pretty powerful motivator. Just a thought. Now, there may be a lot of other approaches and I'm more than willing to uh, entertain them. And I think what we need to do is start a dialogue about these different approaches and trying to understand what would work best in what circumstance, with what group, what, what audience. These are some things that take some time and we, we really do need to, to research. Well, if I think of what you're you're talking about, I mean, there's the emotional human appeal to that approach. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. And and again, uh, we're we're not motivated uh, by logic. It turns out most of us remember we go back to that that person in caveman days when we, they were uh, hearing some rustling in the bushes the ones that sat there and said i'm going to get more data to make a logical decision well they were removed from the gene pool we inherited the brain of the person that said you know what i'm going to jump to a conclusion with uh, incomplete data and get the hell out of here right so using that logical approach while it may seem perfectly rational presumes that we have a rational brain and we really don't our brain is not based on logic our decision making is not based on logic. Let me rephrase that. It's super interesting. <clears throat> Science is cool. Uh, <laughs> communication styles are multi generational. How does a company approach these challenges while addressing behavior change? So I think that's interesting, right? We we were just talking about like human to human, but there's of course the fact that humans are different ages with different predilections. Um, and also, I mean, this ties into the theme of diversity with folks understand things differently based on their backgrounds, and that can be influenced by gender, race, socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. This kind of goes back to the idea of lecturing to people. It turns out that the lecture, there's a definition of a lecture is, is the transference of information from the uh, the the, the lecturer's notes to the listener's notes without going through the minds of either. And that's not going to obviously work. What I've been experimenting with, and there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Don Norman, who is a, a, a thought leader in something called human-centered design or human uh, community-centered uh, human design. And, and what here's, he's suggesting is that we actually create communities. So we would create communities that would create the content. We would create a guide, uh, much like you know the National Initiative, the National um, Institute of Standards and Technology has created the framework, the Nice framework. Well, we would create communities around the Nice framework that would create a specific version of that for their community. And I think that might work better that what we have, instead of expecting IT to come up with all these different versions, we partner up with the different user communities and say, hey, listen, this is the basic guidance that we have created. Can you help us tailor this guidance to your user group with your user community? To get them to create means that they have created buy-in and they have that credibility, that trust that we talked about earlier to their community. So that's my approach. That's how I would do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going to them using their words, trying to, you know, trying to show at least that you're making, like wanting to bridge that gap, I think helps too. You know, just seeing like, um, <clears throat> goes back to uh, the old adage, like when you travel to a country that speaks a different language, like making some sort of effort to at least say, hello, do you speak English in their native language? Like it, you know, it has a completely different, um, a completely different outcome most of the time than just walking up and assuming that everyone speaks English, right? Um, so it, it, it's, it's an interesting concept and it makes sense. And, and the parallels are all around us. If we just open our eyes to those, uh, you know, the, that example that you said, when we go to another culture, 
is so true. It's so true. And it and we just don't think about that when we're in an organization that when we go to accounting or if we go to uh, marketing or some other business unit that we they are actually experts in their world, but their world is significantly different than ours. Their way they look at things, the way they approach things is significantly different. And that if we try to lecture them or if we try to talk to them the way that we would talk to people in our own community, too often it's going to fall on deaf ears. And if we try to be forceful, they're going to be there. You're going to burn a bridge. Know your audience. Exactly. Well, not only knowing your audience, but tailor your message to that audience. Yes. It's not right. enough to know them. You got to actually take that message. You can't tell a, 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 a child that his goldfish died by lecturing your, your, your particular brand of whatever Latin name of your goldfish has deceased and is no longer with us. We've summarily flushed it down the toilet. It will now join the sewage system for the, and be cleansed by the municipality. I mean, you can't do that to a child. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, yeah, I don't have goldfish. All right, Sid, thank you so much for joining us and expanding everybody's minds and perspectives.